So the sacraments in the life of the church are seven means by which we become holy. They are certain ways that God does an action in our life. So just to give a, a brief overview, I know that Father Andrew talked about sacraments last week. Not as well as I could have, but, you know, I guess I'll have to do. So the sacramental life of the church, again, consists of these seven moments. You don't have to receive all seven, but they are seven moments that are set out where God acts in a definitive way to give us his grace, to help us to become holy, and help us to get into heaven. The three sacraments of initiation, which we're going to start to get into tonight, are baptism, confirmation, and holy communion. So baptism is the entryway into the church by which you can then receive the other sacraments, but your life, your faith life is not meant to stop with baptism. In fact, that's just the beginning of it. We'll talk about what confirmation is in a little bit, and of course what Holy Communion does for you in other sessions. Then there's two sacraments that are about nourishing or healing, anointing of the sick. So when we have a physical ailment, we can also receive the forgiveness of our sins, but also strengthening us in dealing with a particular illness or even nearing the end of life. And then when we're talking about just kind of a sins and wanting to remove the guilt of our sins, we have the, the sacrament of confession or reconciliation. So that's also about having our sins forgiven after baptism. And then there's two sacraments that are about service or a vocation, and that's marriage and holy orders or like priesthood. So those two things are again given as ways that God assures us that when we set out on this vocation that he's called us to, he gives us the means to exercise those responsibilities. So tonight, we'll focus in on baptism and confirmation. So again, as a reminder, all sacraments are a sign of God's grace and action, but it's in some physical way. Again, just to have uh, an action done, say, okay, you're baptized, you're confirmed. You say, well, how do I know that, you're, that I'm baptized or that I'm confirmed? And so we have physical signs which show what is happening on the inside because there's kind of a, do a joint action taking place, something that's physical and something that is invisible inside us. And what's physical is demonstrating to us what's happening on the inside. And so every sacrament has something that you can touch, feel, hear, so forth. There's always something that's physical, so you know for sure that this sacrament took place inside you. And that's what these things are. Now, some sacraments are a one-time shot. You, you have it, and that's it. Others can be repeated as needed, or perhaps even every day for the rest of your life. Something like Holy Communion, that's something that can and should be repeated. Same thing for confession. Baptism and confirmation, however, are one-shot deals that once you're baptized and once you're confirmed, you never need to be baptized or confirmed again. In fact, you cannot be. So the sacraments, again, to articulate it from a different angle now, they are things by which God makes the mysteries of Jesus' life actualized in our life. So everything that happens in the life of Jesus is meant to happen in our life, too. And the sacraments are the means by which that is accomplished. So Jesus' eventual passion, death, his resurrection, that's meant to happen to us too. And it's by entering into the sacraments of the church that that is actually accomplished. So th that's, again, what sacraments are in the Catholic Church. So I'm going to uh, just go into baptism a little bit. Now, some of you have been baptized already in some other faith practice, maybe even as a Catholic. So, as I said, you won't be baptized again, but if you're intending to become Catholic at Easter, and I've never been baptized, this is when you'll be baptized at, um, at Easter. So, it has to be the first sacrament because this is the gateway into everything else. So, you can't be confirmed unless you're baptized. You can't receive communion, or you shouldn't receive communion, of course, because it doesn't have the, any effect in you unless you've been baptized. You're, you can't go to confession unless you've been baptized. And you can't receive the sacrament of matrimony unless you've been baptized. And surprisingly, you can't be ordained a priest unless you've been baptized either. So all the sacraments start off with being baptized. And then after you've been baptized, everything else in the church becomes then open to you. 
So it is from the commandment of Jesus that he said, go and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is a pretty uh, clear commandment. He said, go baptize everybody. And baptism is the means by which we then gain participation or entry into Jesus's life and body. So once you're baptized, you are officially a Christian. And by being baptized, you are then joined to Jesus in a way that's been done throughout all the centuries that um, will never need to be repeated. It has to be done in a certain way. I mean, baptism is, uh, is essential to salvation. That we, uh, and there's a couple different ways someone can be baptized, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But that we say that baptism is necessary for salvation, but that it, uh, it's so essential that it can be done pretty easily, but still there's a few things that have to be there. One is you have to be baptized with water. Uh, you can't be baptized with Gatorade or soda or whatever else. That doesn't count. And what I mean by the word valid there is uh, for it to count. If it's an invalid baptism, that means it didn't count. And then you have to be baptized like with your first name, like Mary or Joseph or whatever else. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And just as a side note, you don't say the word amen actually you baptize somebody because you're not baptizing that person in the name of amen, uh, nor does somebody need to respond amen. You just baptize that person in God's name. So there's actually been a little bit of dispute about that. You may think like, well, that seems pretty obvious, but some people have thought, well, what if you were baptized uh, like in the name of Jesus and the other names weren't said? Like, shouldn't that count? And what we've defined in the Catholic Church is, no, it doesn't count. We wouldn't recognize that as a valid baptism. And actually, this is somewhat recently, but in Australia, I think in other places probably, but I think it was there primarily some people are being baptized in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. It's kind of like those are actions that we attribute to like Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the church weighed in and said, like, no, that is an invalid baptism. It has to be Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The ordinary minister of a baptism, and the way that we should understand the word ordinary in the Catholic Church in this context is ordinary would seem to be just a uh, you know, average or basic or whatever, and extraordinary would seem to be better. It's the flip, though, in this context. Ordinary is what, the way it's supposed to happen, and extraordinary means, well, this is still okay, but it's only kind of permitted under the, because if there was some need or special circumstance. So the ordinary or the way that one should be baptized is by a bishop, a priest, or a deacon. However, someone else could validly baptize a person if there was like a true emergency or danger of death. In fact, we've said that the person doing the baptism doesn't even have to be baptized himself. The person could be of another faith practice or could believe in nothing. But if the person baptizes someone in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit with water, pouring water three times, and intends to baptize the person, is doing these actions purposefully, then that's a valid baptism. But that's only kind of under extraordinary situations where we'd even want to consider something like that. So it can be administered, again, in case of an emergency, because we say this is so important and so needed, it could be done anywhere by anybody, essentially. So it, because it's uh, that important to, uh, to someone's like salvation. Now, normally in the Catholic Church, one is baptized as an infant, usually maybe a few weeks after birth. You know, sometimes for different reasons, could be a little longer, but it really should be a few weeks. And it's done in a church with a priest or a deacon. I think I was baptized when I was about six weeks old or something, just as, not that you care, but that's just uh, for your information. Now, because baptism, again, is so important, though, we can say that... Um, the church says we need to make it as available as possible to ensure that as, you know, as many people can get to heaven as possible can. So there's actually three modes by which one could be baptized. Kind of the, the usual way is by water, like I just said. That's the usual way one is baptized. 
However, there is a second way, and that's by blood. And that doesn't mean that you just pour blood on somebody. That means that one can be baptized like in your own blood if you were killed because someone uh, didn't like Jesus or hated Jesus and is killing you because of that hatred of Jesus. Uh, a classic example is if you're familiar with the story in scripture of the holy innocence. So when Jesus was born and, you know, uh, the authorities at the time, Herod, uh, was kind of afraid of him. So he decided to uh, have any boy under the age of two killed in the area. Now these uh, babies, or these boys under the age of two, were slaughtered. They, of course, did not make any choice. They didn't do anything. But they were killed anyway because out of hatred for Christ. So their blood was shed, and that was their baptism. So we can say they went straight to heaven because they had never committed any sins. They are baptized like in their own blood because their blood was shed just like Jesus's was shed on the cross. That means that they are so configured to Jesus at that moment that that is truly their baptism. So that's what it means to be baptized by blood. Now the, th the third way is what we call baptism by desire, which is a little difficult to understand or pin down specifically. Baptism by desire is essentially, well, some people are never baptized in their whole life, and then we might say, well, I guess that person isn't going to heaven, right? You, you, you were never baptized. And the answer is, well, no, not necessarily. We believe that one could have had that desire to be baptized, but never had the opportunity or never knew about it, never knew that he or she had to be, or so forth. So there was kind of a desire that the person, like in his or her own heart, had a desire to do God's will. But for some other reason, it just uh, was never actualized, like physically. So we don't believe that God is limited to acting in these seven ways in these sacraments. There are the, the certain ways that God acts. He can act in other ways that go beyond those things. And I think some people even ask questions about how people are saved who are not Christians. And, and that is how someone is saved, is through this kind of what we call baptism by desire. But because it's a little bit mysterious, I wouldn't recommend that as like the path to say like, oh, well, no one needs to be baptized then. You can just say you had this desire. I mean, God knows what's in our hearts and certainly judges, you know, very mercifully and fairly. But we want to presume that, well, we want everyone to be baptized because then we know that the, the grace has really come into that person. Kind of by the desire, we don't, we don't know for sure, because I can't look at somebody and say, well, you definitely had the desire. I mean, God does, and God knows, and we believe that God will even save them, if, if that kind of distinction makes sense. So again, those are the three ways that one can be baptized. And that's kind of how we reconcile that when we say that baptism is necessary for salvation. Well, then one is baptized by one of these three ways, and that's how one is saved by water, by blood, by desire. Uh, just real quickly, you might have heard the term godparents before. Godparents is the role of, that somebody takes in the church as kind of a sponsor or role model for a person. So like in the natural way, we all have a mom and a dad, and they're our parents. Now our godparents are kind of like our spiritual parents in the sense that they kind of fill the role that like our mom and dad might feel like in a, in a very natural way. So these godparents are meant to be good examples of faith and encouragement for us. They may not be over the years, kind of like parents aren't always the best either. They uh, you know, could, could be great, they could be okay, whatever, but ideally it's someone who is gonna play a role in your life for a very long time. So that's something that when we talk about sponsors, that's what we're actually talking about is if you haven't been baptized, your sponsor will function kind of as your godparent for baptism and your sponsor for confirmation. And it's the similar or this concept to confirmation as well. So if you've been baptized, you still need a sponsor for confirmation. And that's the same logic going on there. Uh, so let's just go into some of the effects of what baptism does. Uh, baptism uh, takes away original sin, in fact, any sin whatsoever that's been committed. So original sin 
comes to us from Adam and Eve that they were the first humans. They were like our representatives and underwent this test that they failed. And our nature, since we all share the same nature, that Adam and Eve had the same human nature, has been corrupted, not ruined, but weakened. And as a result of that, we need this grace of baptism to heal that and give us the remedy. So that's what baptism accomplishes, and that's why it's necessary for every person, because it's not our own sin, like we've done nothing wrong just by being born, but because human nature itself has fallen, there's a need to redeem it. And if you don't think human nature has fallen out there, well, you can take a look at the world and examine and see kind of where things aren't exactly right, or even in your own life where things aren't exactly right. And, you know, it probably doesn't take a huge amount of convincing to realize that there's something that just isn't right in human nature. That's where it comes from. So baptism takes away that sin, but if you're being baptized like as an infant, you've obviously committed no sins of your own. But if you get baptized when you're older, then any sin that you've committed over the course of your entire life gets wiped away. It's a really good deal. So even if you're like 99 years old and you've lived the worst life you could possibly imagine and you get baptized, everything's wiped away. I mean, it's a really good deal. I wouldn't recommend waiting that long, but uh, that's what, how baptism works. That's only a one-shot deal, though. If you've already been baptized, you don't get that again. So baptism, though, also incorporates us into the church, where you're now united or bonded to Jesus in such a special way that it can never be completely broken. At least that connection that we obtain through baptism. What I mean by incorporated into the Paschal mystery, that's a little bit theological, but to break that wordage down a little bit. Incorporated means become part of Jesus's body, that in a mystical way we are united to Jesus so intimately that we become part of his body. He's the head, we are the members, and as I said, everything that happened in Jesus's life, all those mysteries, are now going to take place in us too. So the Paschal mystery, if you ever heard the word Paschal, that you should think Easter. So it's saying like the Easter mysteries, which are Jesus's passion, his suffering, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. That's the whole Paschal mystery, and that's what's intended to happen in the life of every Christian, and it gets started through baptism. So, None of us have suffered and died on the cross like Jesus did. In fact, none of us is even innocent, so what good would it do? But even pretend for a moment that uh, we could suffer on the cross and die and that it didn't have any effect with reconciling us to God. The fact is we haven't done it, and I don't think anyone's intending to have that happen to you. But Jesus did do that, and he suffered wholly innocent. He died on the cross, and he rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty good. We aren't, gonna, we aren't capable of doing that, and we know that. However, it'd be nice if we could share in some way in what Jesus did. That way, what he did, we could also have happened to us. And the way that happens is through baptism. Through this sacrament, one doesn't actually, you don't actually get nailed to the cross I guarantee you. Uh, you don't have to feel the pain of the nails going in your hands and your feet. You don't have to die and then get buried and three days later rise up. But all those things happen inside you in this spiritual way so that one day when we actually do die, we will truly rise with Jesus. So the effects of what Jesus did and accomplished become realized in us and we never had to actually do that. It's a pretty remarkable deal that we didn't have to actually do that. Jesus did all the work, we just get all the benefit. It's, you know, pretty incredible. So baptism, again, doesn't take away death in this life. It just takes away 
eternal death, that our eventual death, whenever that happens in this world, is really just a completion of what's already happened in baptism. And then we rise with Jesus again to a, what we can call a new dimension of life where there is no more death, that Jesus has conquered death in this world. And so again, it's like our final participation like in our baptism. And that's why actually, we actually had two funerals here today, but in baptism, we use this candle called the Paschal candle or the Easter candle and we uh, light different candles from it. And that same candle, not literally the same candle, but the same Paschal candle is used at one's funeral too. It's to show the connection between what happened in baptism, like we spiritually go into the tomb of Jesus and rise with him to new life, is now gonna be actualized by our own physical death here on earth. Or that's what we're praying and hoping for. So I hope that that kind of makes sense. So once we uh, have this accomplished in us, we no longer die in a way that means that we'll perish and never live on. We actually won't experience death in the next life because of what's taken place through the sacrament. Again, Jesus has reconciled us to his Father, and we participate in that reconciliation by being baptized ourselves as if we had suffered and died on the cross too. So what we also can say with uh, children being baptized is some, I don't hear the criticism too much, but sometimes people wonder why infants are baptized and why, uh, why shouldn't someone just wait till you're an adult to be baptized? That you're not making the choice on your own, clearly as an infant or even as a young child, but as an adult, you should know what you're doing and, you know, you can kind of make your own choice. So just to kind of uh, debunk that thinking a little bit, you know, we are not professing, like we are not calling to mind like, okay, God, I choose you right now and I'm declaring my faith and this is the faith I'm being baptized in. Because in a way, like what, what good is our faith if it's just our personal faith? Um, I mean, if someone stands up and says that, it's like, well, that's nice. But I think it takes on a whole new dimension to say that I'm being baptized in the faith of the church. And that's the faith that we get baptized in. In fact, when the priest says the priest says, this is our faith, this is the faith of the church, and we're proud to profess it. So what he's saying in that moment is you're not being baptized because you understand the faith so well, or you are such a good person, or you've made this grand declaration, you're being baptized in a way because God chooses you. And that's the way we have to orient all this stuff. God always takes the initiative with us. He chooses us to be his sons and daughters. And by that choice, by that election, we are made into God's family. And we are just receiving this grace. We have to cooperate with it. We have to receive it. He doesn't impose it on us, but it changes the way we think about it. Okay, it's not just we're making this choice by ourselves without anybody's help. That's totally wrong. We're actually doing it because God has called us first to it. Before one could even want to be baptized, God would call that person. So we're never like on our own. God has already called you here and bringing you closer to that baptismal font before you could even think about doing it yourself. It's always God's project, and it's always God's initiative. So we believe that once you reach the age of reason, however, that you're able to make like a choice. So around the age of seven, one can then kind of determine, you know, choices for yourself a little bit. So before you're seven years old, yeah, you might uh, kick the dog or whatever, but you really don't know that like, okay, you maybe know you shouldn't, but you don't know that it's in a way like kind of it's a sin or if you are mean to your mom or your dad or whatever. But once you get past that point, we can say that you understand enough to know you shouldn't do it, but you're choosing it anyway as a way of kind of turning away from God. Just uh, an example though, but so if there was like a 10-year-old come to be baptized, his parents brought this 10-year-old to me and like, please baptize our son. And the son's like, no, I don't want to be baptized. Like, you can't do this to me. I don't want to do it. I say, I can't do it then. Um, this 10-year-old, like, has enough knowledge to say, I don't want this. 
um, I couldn't, it'd be wrong actually to just like grab the person and just handcuff them and say, okay, too bad. Like, you know, uh, you're just going to do it. However, if there was like a five-year-old and kicking and screaming and, you know, being difficult and say, I don't want to be baptized. I don't want it. I'd say like, too bad. Um, and say like, get ready, you're getting wet. And that'd be the end of it. And I wouldn't feel badly. But just as a quick story, once I was doing the baptism and I was baptizing an infant for this family, however old this kid was, you know, I could say two months or whatever. And they had an older boy who was like five years old, already baptized. And the five-year-old was just being difficult and kind of causing problems. And one of the things that we do in a baptism is those who are baptized make a renewal of their baptismal promises to reject Satan and evil and all this stuff. So the questions are like, do you reject Satan? Do you reject evil? You know, all this bad stuff, the pomp and circumstance of it. And the kid screams out, no, uh, to that answer. Um, and the parents are just like mortified. Um, but again, like that five-year-old didn't understand that he was, I don't, I don't think he was saying, I want to be attached to Satan. Um, he was just answering in a way that he knew was going to cause problems. So if that gives you a clear understanding of like how you can be like at the age of reason and you know, you're just being difficult. Again, with uh, baptism as an infant, that's something that's been done since apostolic times, actually. So we believe that because baptism is necessary for salvation, it's good to baptize someone soon after birth. If someone is unbaptized later in life, well, then we want to do that too. But we don't just want to baptize someone and say, okay, like, we'll figure out the rest later. We want to fully incorporate you and kind of get you up to speed given your, uh, your state in life, so to speak. And so that's why when someone's baptized as an adult, we also do confirmation and give that person Holy Communion. Our typical practice is usually to baptize someone as an infant, you receive Holy Communion around like eight or seven and be confirmed like at 13 or 14. But that's not even set in stone, that's the more typical path. If you're a little older, you know, we just kind of do it all together. So adults though, um, you have to desire baptism. Uh, if, even if you were baptized, but you had just no internal desire for it, I mean, in your heart, you're like, this means nothing to me. I don't want this. You know, you may not uh, be able to receive kind of the full effects of it. I mean, you've been baptized, but if you truly didn't even want it, the effects may not come like into you just yet. Uh, you have to have some desire for it as an adult. As a, again, as a kid, it doesn't matter. But as an adult, you have to have a desire for it. So if you're unbaptized here, uh, you can go ahead and make that desire in your heart right now that you do want it, and, uh, and then you'll receive everything. So in fact, you wouldn't even be here unless you had a desire. So you don't have to worry about that. But I'm just saying that that's why we don't just baptize adults unwillingly, because then they would have no desire for it, and that's not really um, respectful to that person, but then also to what we're actually trying to get by having somebody baptized. Uh, so there's different, there's this character of baptism that you receive. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit just because I actually uh, wrote this very long paper about it for most of my first year being a priest. And you're probably thinking like, what a complete waste of time that was. But I wrote on specifically what this saint, Saint Augustine, who lived in like the 400s, and he wrote about how when you're baptized, you receive this permanent mark on your soul that never goes away. And so I wrote about what that mark meant and stuff like that. Just that little itty bitty thing. Um, and, you know, probably spent more time on it than uh, you would ever probably care to even read about. But if you like to, you can go ahead and read what I wrote and uh, put you straight to sleep. So Augustine lived in this time where there was this group called the Donatists. And the Donatists probably mean nothing to you. But they were these people who lived in North Africa who started to doubt the effectiveness of receiving a sacrament like baptism. So let's take, for example, here that um, you were baptized by me or are going to be baptized by me or something. And, you know, later on you realize that I'm a really bad person. And you might start to wonder, well, did that baptism count because Father Barnes baptized me and I know he's a bad person. 
So you might start to wonder, gosh, I don't know if my baptism really counted or not. And that's sort of what they were thinking. Because in the early church, sometimes people under persecutions uh, committed apostasy, which means that they would just totally rejected the faith publicly, including even priests. So by doing that, that's a very grave sin. They started to wonder, like, well, if that's the person who baptized me, does that kind of mess me up then too? And that's what they started thinking. So they thought, we need a pure community here where we know the only people who are doing this stuff are, you know, pure persons so that there's no, like, you know, dissension or no uh, problems with further sacraments being received. That's really problematic, by the way, and what they're saying is actually not true. And that's what Augustine was actually writing about. They were actually a pretty big group, and even though his arguments are very persuasive, you know, can't be refuted, uh, even they didn't listen to him. They got it wrong for a long time. What we're saying, though, is regardless of who baptizes you, it counts. If it's done, I mean, correctly, of course, with water in, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Even if that person goes on to be like a really bad person one day, uh, the worst you could think of, your baptism still counts because it's through the work that's done, this sacrament takes part in your soul and never needs to be repeated. Even if you one day, they'll go on and become a really bad person, you might think, gosh, should I lose my baptism? I know I was baptized, but then I went and did these really bad things, and I even left the church, or I committed apostasy, I mean, whatever else, and you want to come back one day. Well, Augustine deals with that too. And he says, no, you don't need to be rebaptized. In fact, you can't be rebaptized because that mark that you receive on your soul is permanent. It lasts not only for the rest of this life, it lasts into eternity. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you're it doesn't mean that you're saved once you're baptized regardless of what you do in the rest of your life. I mean, that matters as well. But what he's saying is that your connection to Jesus and the church is always possible because of your baptism, regardless of where you went. And this is even before the Protestant Reformation and schisms and things like that. But Augustine even answers the question of like, what if someone is baptized kind of not in full communion with the Catholic Church? such as baptized like, as a Lutheran or a Baptist or something. And again, what I already told you, if you've been baptized in, again, with water and in that correct like formula, it still counts. That's how powerful this effect is. And because this kind of theology of Augustine was a little bit new for his time, he had to use some different examples to kind of help explain how this worked. And one of the more powerful examples that he used is of this Roman military mark, which uh, in this little paper I wrote about for like six pages, uh, probably too much detail. But the point is that in the Roman military, in this, in kind of the imperial army, um, he compared it like as an analogy to being baptized. So one was kind of made part of this military unit. He went through kind of this like training period, kind of mimics you know, a preparation for baptism. And then once you were kind of fully incorporated into this military unit, you received basically like a tattoo or a mark on your body. And this mark, of course, you know, doesn't go away. Anybody who has a tattoo in here, you know that all too well. But like in the Roman military, sometimes what would be the worst crime you could do as like in the military would well, be desertion. That's like the worst thing you can do besides, I guess, betrayal. But deserting like your unit or deserting your brothers and going off and doing whatever, you would think like, well, then I guess you've left the military and there's no hope for you. That's not even quite true. He even gives the example of how, okay, like they got in big trouble for doing that. But there was even some possibility of coming back to the Roman military. And he explained that if they did come back, they didn't receive another mark on their body. If they already had that mark, they didn't get marked again. And he further explained that, well, what if someone, let's say, no one would ever do this, but let's just say you wanted to trick somebody that you were in the military and you put that same like mark on your, 
like hand already to be like, see, I, I did serve in the military, but you really didn't. Um, but then maybe one day you do join the military. He, Augustine even said, well, then you didn't receive that mark again either. You have already been marked, albeit imperfectly, but because you received that mark, you're, you aren't ever marked again. And so that analogy is something that has been carried on in the church for all these centuries, I mean, uh, 16 centuries later, we still use that to kind of explain or understand how it's possible to receive the mark of baptism on your soul and never need to be marked again. And just for some of the, I think, well, how did Augustine justify this? Well, he used scripture and he gives a lot of examples in scripture how that supports what he's saying. He talked about some different councils or authority that existed in the church. And he talked about the liturgical practice as well, that for priests, they, priests were never reordained. Or if, in other words, if a priest went off and committed a sin of apostasy, he didn't go off and get, become an ordained a priest again if he came back. So we're saying, well, we do understand how it's possible, because a priest receives that same indelible mark of priesthood, that that's what... Um, the same thing takes place in, in baptism. And he also talked about being kind of the apostolic tradition as well. And so uh, he even mentioned how in the Donatists, they even had people who in their own community kind of fell away and came back and they didn't, they kind of overlooked it a little bit. So he's even saying, even you like recognize the truth of that. So really there's a lot of uh, powerful arguments that he put forward there. So that was uh, St. Augustine. What he says is that when we're baptized, we are made sons and daughters of the church. And because of this, like, sonship or being a daughter that we receive, uh, we can always come back to God and still be his children. And one of the more powerful stories of that is the prodigal son passage in Luke, 15, Luke chapter 15 in the gospel. So in that passage, you have the son who's of course, um, very bad to his father. He's like, go hurry up and die so I can take all your stuff. And he gets his inheritance. He squanders it. Uh, he's left with nothing. He's eating, you know, like, he sees the food of pigs and he thinks that even looks pretty good. And he finally realizes, okay, maybe I had it better off before. Kind of like someone who, if you've ever felt like you stray from the church, and you think, okay, maybe it was better the way things were previously. And we can start to think, well, God will never take me back fully. I mean, I've messed that up. But maybe he'll take me back like as, as his servant. I mean, I had been his son before. He thinks maybe I can just be his servant. And at least that's certainly better than where I'm at now. So he goes back to his father to ask just to be his servant. Not he wouldn't even dare to ask to be his son again. But the father comes and greets him and says, no, like, you can't be my servant. You are my son. And that's what we're saying in baptism, too, that when we're marked as God's sons and daughters, we can't be anything less anymore. That this is what God wants for us, and this is the only way that God's going to look at us, as his sons and daughters. So that's what we're saying in this passage here. Of when he comes back and he's welcomed back into his father's house, he's not welcomed back as a servant, he's welcomed back as a son. So in baptism, we do receive the Holy Spirit, and we're made part of the church. Original sin is removed, or any other sins. What's the role of confirmation now? So confirmation is meant to mark our growth in the spiritual life, but to mark it in such a way that makes us a good witness for the faith as well. Just like when we're born, you're not meant to just be born and kind of that's it. There's a kind of a perfection which slowly takes place in a person where you kind of grow and develop and become the person God has made you to be. The same thing happens in the spiritual life where baptism gets that process started, but confirmation is what gives us the fullness of the Paschal mystery so that we can become perfect. That's what God has intended us to be, is to become his perfect sons and daughters and confirmation is to mark that growth. So again, with like our bodies, you can think of like, well, what's the perfect age? And I don't know, I mean, I guess there's a different debate on that, but 
you know, whatever you kind of think of like a well-formed, like physically mature person looks like, well, that's kind of like a perfect age. It's not like, you know, but even like our intellects continue to grow and develop, hopefully. So that's sort of what confirmation is. It's meant to bring us like in a spiritual way towards that perfect age or that perfect growth, intellectually speaking, so to speak. Uh, there's an increase of grace that we get through baptism or through confirmation. It's a real increase in grace where we receive this fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason why I mentioned chrism oil there is that's also used at baptism. Chrism oil is to signify that one is being configured more closely to Christ. Configured is a fancy word of saying joined or made into. So we are configured into Christ in the chrism oil, again, that sounds like Christ, is to show that that is what is taking place by doing something, again, on the outside, to tell us this is what is happening on the inside by the work of God. The chrism oil is to show that in confirmation, we receive the completion of this Paschal mystery. So Confirmation is kind of like the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and Mary at Pentecost, and then they go out and become these witnesses to the rest of the world. That's what confirmation is doing for us, too. There's uh, this action that's referenced as kind of the laying on of hands, as something further or beyond baptism. And that's what is being described as in confirmation, as how it's being instituted by Christ and practiced in the early church. This laying on of hands is something that the bishop does in confirmation, where he's, even if it's from a distance, but his hands are extended and put out over them as like, now the Holy Spirit is coming down upon them, and then they are sealed with this gift of the Holy Spirit by using chrism oil. So it is to give um, spiritual strength. By being confirmed, you receive a new vigor for the faith, and are made ready to kind of enter into battle, so to speak. Hopefully not actual battle, but certainly in our life, there's spiritual battles all the time. We're tempted by different things. We feel weak by different things. We need strength, and that's what confirmation is doing for us, is it gives us that strength we need to engage these spiritual battles. That's one of the purposes of oil, like in the ancient world, and how it got to be incorporated into being used by the church in our sacramental practices, is that oil was always a sign of receiving strength to enter into like this battle or healing. And that's kind of what oil is used for in the church as well, strength, and then also healing for some of the other sacraments. We want to say that we're marked for combat. Again, it's always in a spiritual sense, but we're marked in our confirmation to kind of engage this battle that we need, that we're going to undergo in our life. And what marks us for this journey or this battle is the cross. That's what is how we're marked in our confirmation is someone is marked on his or her forehead with the sign of the cross. And that's saying that it's the cross that marks us and gives us the strength to enter into whatever it is we're going to face. The character that you receive is uh, built upon baptism. So again, to be confirmed, you have to be baptized. And it doesn't take away anything from baptism, but it brings it to perfection. Just uh, in case you like SAT, like analogies or whatever, but we could say that confirmation is to baptism what growth is to birth. If, again, if that analogy makes sense to you. So we're born in baptism, we grow into perfection through confirmation. It's a, like, again, it's a step-by-step -step maturity. Again, people could think of being confirmed like, well, now I'm like an adult in the Catholic faith. And I'd say that's not really true either because that sort of mistakes our own action is like, well, now I'm affirming my faith to be not you know, uh, immature, but I guess to be mature, and it's always God choosing us for this deeper um, bond with him, that it's always God who chooses us, 
and we respond to it. And that's what happens in confirmation. Even though we develop and grow into really the person God has always made us to be, it's still a process that is initiated, it's sustained by the Holy Spirit, and brought to perfection. So there's different ages at which someone can be confirmed. We don't have a set practice in the Catholic Church. In this area, uh, usually someone is confirmed in eighth grade. That's, you know, if all is being equal, that's kind of when it happens. I got confirmed when I was in 12th grade. That was a little late for, I was delinquent. But uh, people get, can get confirmed at almost any time. What's more important than the age of confirmation is what the effect of confirmation is. Again, it's the fullness of the Holy Spirit to make you into the, the perfect son or daughter God wants you to be and that he intends you to be. So it's to take us out of ourselves and to help us to bear witness. I don't know if any of you ever feel afraid to, whatever your faith, however you describe your faith right now, I don't know if you've ever been afraid to show your faith to another person or to talk about it in front of another person. That's something that if you want to say, well, I'm never afraid to do that, then I would say that you're lying. Because the fact is, everyone feels that way from time to time, including me. So what we kind of need is God's help to overcome our fears with bearing witness. Because for starters, we probably all feel that, well, hey, I'm not worthy to be a witness. And that's the truth. Or that people are going to see right through me for being, you know, kind of a bad witness or certainly not good enough. Or that I'm not going to know all the answers. Or that um, I don't know if I even want to do it or that's... I, we fear, like, what are the consequences if someone were to know, like, what I really think or believe, what would they think, what would that person think of me then, and how might that change kind of our situation? So those are all fears that we all deal with in different ways, and it's especially hard for people who know you well. That's why a priest is actually never assigned, at least in his early years, to, like, wherever he's from, specifically, like, whatever parish you grew up in. Because, well, for a lot of reasons, no one would take you seriously. Um, you know, you even have that problem no matter where you go sometimes. But there's the sense of, well, I remember you when you uh, would kick the dog when you were 10 years old. Or, you know, I remember how you would show up to church and never pay attention or all these things. And now you want to tell me how to do things. And you're like, yep, that's right. Um, so it's kind of good to have, it's for like priests, that's why, especially younger priests, to go to a place where people don't know kind of that, that side of you. And, and none of those things ever apply to me, by the way, but <laughs> they apply to other people. So it's to, what gives us the courage to do any of this? It's the Holy Spirit. He marks us in such a way that, um, I'm kind of losing my place in the outline, but that's fine. He marks us in such a way that we can now bear witness. So. Th and I said, you're confirmed on your forehead. That's the mark the bishop, and he, again, he's the ordinary person who does it. It's to show our connection to the bishop by doing this. That's why confirmation is even like delayed after baptism. But it's to show that you receive this mark on your forehead that we can't even hide if we wanted to. So if you think about it this way, and this is what uh, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about, like why are we confirmed on our foreheads? And his reasoning was, like, think about when it's cold out. Well, you might cover your face with different things or our hands or whatever else. But the thing that is probably the hardest thing to cover up is, like, right in the middle of your face. Not only that, unless you're afraid of people, but when you look at another person or talking with that person, where are you usually looking? Well, usually someone's eyes, like, right there. In other words, when you're confirmed there in a spiritual way, so yeah, I mean, you're not going to receive a tattoo here that everyone then sees this cross, but it's still operating in a way that, in a mysterious way, people are seeing the fact that there's something different about the way that the words are coming out of you or the way you're living your life. And even when you're too afraid to do it on your own, which is most of the time, God still like says, oh, I'm going to kind of take over and 
use you in a way that I want you to do something right now. He doesn't take over us without any of our input, but he kind of takes over enough to where we just have to kind of cooperate. And that's the working of the Holy Spirit. That's what confirmation does for us. So that's why people are different after you're confirmed. So just like the Holy Spirit confirmed and strengthened the apostles to be witnesses, because after Jesus rose from the dead, they weren't exactly, they didn't get it all right. In fact, they locked themselves in a room and were afraid of everybody else. Even after they saw Jesus rise from the dead, they still couldn't quite get it. But once the Holy Spirit came down upon them, that's when things were different. It was these 50 days after Easter where that's where the church came into being. That's where things became different. And that's where these apostles started doing these amazing things. And we have this whole book in the Bible about it called the Acts of the Apostles. Now, the Acts of the Apostles, though, are telling us, well, these are the works of everyone. Once you have this full gift of the Holy Spirit to do, these things apply to all of us. So the Acts of the Apostles are not over. We're not apostles, but we still have the working of the Holy Spirit in us. Again, think of maybe it this way, if you can understand. Baptism is like your personal Easter. So none of us, again, have died with Jesus, and, or none of us have died like Jesus, and then rose from the dead on our own power. But when we're baptized, it's like we're having Easter done to us. And what we're commemorating every Easter is what took place that first, that, that, that only Easter, and we're just renewing that celebration of it. And our participation in it occurs through our baptism. Now, confirmation is our personal Pentecost, where with the same power and the same effect that the Holy Spirit came down on the apostles and Mary, and transform them, that's the same Holy Spirit that comes down upon us in our confirmation and transforms us into bearing witness to him. So what we could say is that why is bearing witness so important? Well, it's because this is how God's message continues to be shared with others. It's not, it's never meant to be just us and God and no one else. God wants everyone to know about this he knows the most effective way for people to, to come to God is through other people. In fact, probably in some way you could think back in your own life, who has contributed to your faith life? I mean, there has to be somebody because the fact is you never come to God just by yourself. There's always someone else, even in a very small way, has contributed or kind of God has spoken or acted through that person to you. That doesn't mean that everything everybody does is God working through that person. It's just that God can use all these things for his purposes. And that's why he wants us to bear witness to him so that he can use us to bear witness and to bring other people to him. It would be kind of scary for people to come to God in these other ways. So he knows the best way for it to happen is through other people. Again, just like baptism, one needs a, a sponsor uh, to kind of show you how to do this witness. In other words, how are you going to engage these battles? So, for example, if you feel like, you know, whenever I'm on the road, you know, I get really mad and I swear a lot and, you know, I make obscene gestures to other people and I become a really terrible person. And you could say, well, maybe my sponsor could offer some words of guidance about it. Now, your sponsor may think to him or herself, like, I probably do that more than you do. But perhaps that person could say, you know, like, I've heard that you could say some prayers as you're driving or turn off the radio or um, you, you could read this book here or you can do this and that might begin to help you. And you could say, yeah, thank you. And the, the sponsor's probably thinking, like, I probably need to do twice that stuff. Um, but th that's kind of the, the role of the sponsor. Is it doesn't mean that your sponsor like, is perfect. It's just someone to assist you in your life of faith. And that's just one small battle that probably um, a good amount of you face. What about other battles in your life, though? 
That's why these persons are so beneficial to us. You're not limited to seek advice from that person. It's just the church sees to it that at least you have that person. You can always ask anybody else um, you know, for help too. And that's the way that the, our faith life is supposed to work by being supported by other people. Now in confirmation as well, you receive this mark and it's only once. So once you've been confirmed, you never need to be confirmed again. And just in case you're wondering, sometimes uh, there's other faith practices like in the Episcopal Church or something like that, that they do confirmation. Confirmation, though, if it's not done in the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, is not a valid confirmation. So I don't really outline this too much here, but... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, confirmation, though, has to be done and can only be done by a priest or a bishop. Not even a deacon can confirm you. Because baptism is so necessary for salvation, that's why it's so open and available. Confirmation is not necessary for salvation. So if you're baptized here, you're not confirmed, uh, you're still doing okay. But confirmation, though, it's really important and it's really good. In fact, the church tells us that even if someone were unconfirmed but dying, we should go ahead and confirm that person because it still obtains a good spiritual benefit you know, for that person on that soul because you received this permanent mark. However, I mean, it's not absolutely necessary. It's really good and important for your life, and I don't think that um, you can really take your faith life seriously unless you are trying to be confirmed. But that's why, uh, you know, confirmation works a little bit differently. So the power to confer, or in other words, to administer the sacrament of confirmation belongs only to someone who's been ordained a priest or as a bishop. So normally, the bishop is the one to confirm you because it's showing our connection again to the apostles. The bishops are the successors to the apostles. And it's to show that um, just how significant and important this is, that the bishop himself is doing it. However, sometimes, especially for adults at Easter, there's one bishop in this area and there are 69 parishes. He can't be in 69 places for Easter. Uh, it's pretty hard. So he will delegate, or in other words, he'll allow priests in these parishes to administer confirmation to those who are desiring confirmation at Easter. Normally though, for like an eighth grader, the bishop is always the one to confirm. So a priest has the power to do it. He just normally doesn't do it. In fact, I've never confirmed anybody. I uh, would like to one day, but uh, I would need, unless someone were dying, I would need the permission of the bishop to do so. But at least because of being ordained a priest, I have the power in me somewhere to do it, if that makes sense. So once you're again confirmed, you're good for the rest of your life. Even if you don't fully understand all of the gifts or the effects of it, you still um, obtain it and you have the rest of your life to kind of enjoy it or soak it in like what that fully has given to you. You know, in my own life, confirmation has certainly been a huge role for me and I think brought me to the priesthood. So I'm very grateful for my confirmation and I didn't appreciate that it was needed at the time, but once it happened, I began to see like, I think this actually made a difference. And I hope that the same is true for all of you who um, are working towards that. Another special thing about confirmation is, regardless of why you're in this room, if you've been baptized before or haven't been or whatever else, everyone is gonna get confirmed at Easter if, if that's, of course, what you're going for. That's what kind of you can say, that's what's gonna unite you all together because the Holy Spirit is the bond that brings us all together anyways. And so that makes confirmation even a little bit more special in that all of you who will be confirmed to Easter can share that together. In fact, uh, confirmation is so significant that we can even say it changes our identity. You don't become a different person, but we can say we take on like a different name, so to speak. 
In the Bible, we have different examples of people being given a different name when they're given a new task or kind of a, a new um, gift of God in their life. So the, in like the Old Testament, there was Abram, whose name became Abraham. In the New Testament, we have Saul, who became Paul. Or we have um, um, Simon, who became Peter. Those are all examples, and there's others, of how that person's name was changed to show that something different is now taking place in his life. That also happens in confirmation, too. You can, you can actually take on your baptismal name, too, but it's to show that there's something that um, is a little more intentional or different now about confirmation. So I chose the name uh, Thomas More as my confirmation saint. So when the bishop confirmed me, he didn't confirm me by my first name, which is Nicholas. He confirmed me by my confirmation name, which is Thomas. So he said, Thomas, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's a really, I didn't appreciate it until it actually happened, but I noticed, like, why did he call me Thomas? That's not my name, but it, it felt right, if that still makes sense, because you choose the name ahead of time, and that's what he calls you. He's calling you something different that you have never been called before. Uh, you don't have to legally change your name or anything. This is just a, a spiritual practice. But I think that that's a very... Uh, important thing to consider, like, who you might like to be your confirmation saint. In many respects are, it's not so much you who chooses your confirmation saint, it's more your confirmation saint who chooses you. That there's something about that person's life that I think we have a saint in heaven who's already looking out for us and says, you know, I think that uh, I kind of want to be your special patron. Maybe that saint's life starts to mirror our own, there's something about that person's life that really um, resonates with us. And so that's why it's good to read about the saints and to start to think about maybe who could resonate well with you. Who's a good role model that you want to look up to? And, there's, and I think when you'll know it's right when you say, that's the one I want. And so sometimes it takes a while to get to that point, but you just know it when it happens. They're like, yep, that's the one that I want. And again, I think it's not so much you who chose that saint, it's or that, that saint who chose you. So that's something you can just kind of keep in the back of your mind over these next couple months. Uh, just to sum up real quickly, in the Catholic Church, there's this process of initi initiation, which is one process, but it has like three moments. Baptism, confirmation, and Holy Communion. So through like becoming Catholic as an adult, those are the three things that one receives, and that makes you like fully initiated. As a child, though, we kind of separate them for different reasons, but we kind of do this as a, as a way to say that becoming part of the church is a process, and in growing in your faith is not meant to just be kind of like a one-step thing. If you think about um, like a different job maybe you've had, or you want to think about it this way, like in a good sense, like joining a fraternity or sorority, that kind of integrating into that community, into that family, or into this new job, yeah, you, know, you can show up that first day and you can kind of be a part of things, but you don't know all the lingo yet. You're not really fully integrated yet. You still feel like you're kind of getting your sea legs or you're still getting to know people, especially in a good sense, the fraternity or sorority, you um, usually have like a pledging period where that's kind of like a, a probationary status where you're moving towards becoming fully part of this community. And that's sort of what this is right now. We don't make you do pledge stuff, but you think of it that way where like you're kind of moving towards like, do you want to be part of this? And then like, we're obviously saying we want you to be part of this, but we want to make sure that you also want to be part of this. And that's what pledging is supposed to do. And then you kind of are fully initiated in a good way that you're now fully part of this community. And so it's to kind of mark like different steps in that process. And again, when think of a job, even if you take on a new job, usually you're not given like, okay, day one, start doing everything. That's a little overwhelming. 
you're given things a little bit over time and then you're able to kind of exercise everything. And that's true in the church as well, that once you receive these three sacraments, everything in the church is wide open to you. You now have gotten the full like gamut of things and the other sacraments are there as needed for the rest of your life, but that you're fully initiated and you are able to do anything in the church and to fully have um, your faith come alive. So that's what this process of initiation is for, and that's kind of how it works. So that's uh, a lot to cover tonight, baptism and confirmation, but hopefully uh, you got a little bit out of this tonight. So if you have any questions, I just actually recommend maybe you want to just talk to me afterwards, but we can maybe just finish up with a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty Father, we thank you for the gifts of your sacraments and ask that you bestow your grace upon all those who are preparing to be baptized and confirmed at, these, at this Easter vigil that you will guide and bring to completion all the good you've already brought about in their lives. Help them to know the love and support of your entire church, to be welcomed into your family. Help all those who have been baptized here to once again appreciate more deeply how you've already chosen us to be part of your family, renew us in the grace of that moment, and bring it to completion and bring us to eternal life one day. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.